Hello, everyone, and welcome. We're excited that so many of you could join us today for Setting Boundaries to Find Peace. I'm Jason MacArthur, the Events Coordinator for the Public Programs Department of California Institute of Integral Studies, a nonprofit university in San Francisco. As many of us are descendants of settlers, immigrants, or descendants of those forcefully brought to this continent, we at CIS Public Programs must recognize and never forget that our university's building in San Francisco occupy traditional unceded Ramatush Ohlone lands. If you are interested in learning more about native lands, languages, and territories, we encourage you to visit native-land.ca. Now, let me first introduce our presenters, Nedra Glover-Tawab and Elizabeth Markle, and then we'll get right to the conversation. Elizabeth Markle is a licensed psych psychologist, speaker, writer, researcher, and associate professor of the Community Mental Health Department at the California Institute of Integral Studies. Dedicated to multi-theoretical and multi-level approaches to individual and community health and healing, her current area of study and innovation is around combining clinical expertise with, with social entrepreneurship to create sustainable thriving cultures of health and wellness. Nedra Glover-Tawab, a licensed therapist and sought after relationship expert, has practiced relationship therapy for 12 years and is the founder and owner of the group therapy practice, Kaleidoscope Counseling. She has been recently featured in the New York Times, The Guardian, Psychology Today, Self, and Vice, and has appeared on numerous podcasts, including Don't Keep Your Day Job, Do The Thing, and Therapy for Black Girls. Tawab runs a popular Instagram account where she shares practices, tools, and reflections for mental health and hosts weekly Q&As about boundaries and relationships. And now, let me turn it over to Elizabeth and Nedra. Well, hi, Nedra. Thank you so, so much for being here with us today. Yes, thank you for having me. Such a pleasure. Yeah, and I want to say congratulations on the publication of your forthcoming book. How exciting. Yes, yes. I'm so excited for it to be in the hands and before so many people. Yeah. Well, setting boundaries to find peace is sort of the launching point for our conversation today. And I thought we would dive right in with the topic that is um, the source of confusion for many. So mm -hmm. if you'd be willing to dive right in, what the heck are boundaries actually? <laughs> well, boundaries are parameters that we set in our relationships. They are verbal and they are behavioral. Sometimes that looks like saying no, and sometimes that looks like telling people what we need. But it's really a way for us to create healthy relationships with ourselves and with others. Wow, well, there's a whole lot in those few sentences for us to unpack, but maybe we can start with how you got so interested in this work that you have really sort of made it your, your opus these days. Mm. Well, you know, I think for many of us, we try to, to do things and we don't necessarily know the thing that we're trying to do is set boundaries. And that's how it started for me. When I was in grad school, um, one of the professors mentioned that we could go to college counseling for, you know, for free, you get 12 free sessions. And if you want to be a therapist, you should try it. And I said, okay, I'll give it a shot. No clue what I was going to talk about, of course. And so I went and apparently I ended up talking about boundary issues and I had no clue I was talking about boundary issues. I was talking about my relationships with people and how I was trying to set certain expectations and they were pushing back. And the word boundaries came up and I'm like, huh, I've never heard that before. And from there, I started to do a lot of my own research on like, what is this concept of boundaries? And just so, you know, my first client was a client who was dealing with enmeshment in their family of origin, and they were trying to break away from the family and be a little more autonomous. And I got to talk to them about boundaries. And just as I've been practicing 14 years now, I've talked to so many people about boundaries, couples, um, setting boundaries in their relationships, people with work-life balance issues, anxiety, and how boundaries impact our ability to 
um, stand up for ourselves and our relationships and really advocate for what we want. With anxiety, I find it really interesting that we don't look at the boundaries that could really help us with anxiety or depression, such as advocating for ourselves and relationships. I have so many clients who would like replay scenarios of interactions that they had, you know, years ago, earlier that day, things that were coming up in the future. And setting boundaries became a really beautiful way to, to kind of subdue all of that anxiety because it was like, you know, well, what can you say? What can you do? And they're like, oh, I never thought about that. I thought I just had to be really anxious about this interaction. It's like, well, you have some power here. And, you know, maybe the next time this happens, we can, you know, come up with a plan for what you could say or do. And, and I found that that helped, that helped a ton with some folks' anxiety. And so just thinking about boundaries in this very broad way and how it can help us in so many different areas um, it just, it just sort of flowed naturally. Wow. But what you say about people not necessarily coming to therapy saying, I have boundary issues or people being taught in their families, Hey, these are healthy boundaries. We really lack mm -hmm. the language and the education to know about this. You've made some incredible lists on your Instagram and in your book about, you know, the signs mm -hmm. that, and so I'm wondering if you can share a little bit about the signs that you struggle with boundaries or that you need mm. stronger boundaries? Mm. Well, enmeshment is one, you know, codependency is another. Um, resentment, your feelings really are huge indicators that you need boundaries. When we find ourselves feeling resentful, frustrated, anxious, um, because of upcoming interactions, past interactions, it can be an indicator that you are in need of some boundaries. Also burnout. These things are happening because something is needed. Often we just bypass what we feel. We try to dismiss it and say, oh, well, I'm just a little worried about this thing, but why? It's so important for us to know why we're upset about things, why we're worried about things, why we are avoiding certain things is so important to know. And with boundaries, we can better understand those things. Got it. If I'm getting you right, part of what you're saying mm -hmm. is that people come in saying, I'm in pain, right? I feel anxious. Mm -hmm. I feel depressed. My relationships are in chaos. My work is overwhelming. I'm burnt out. And that mm -hmm. while often we just want the pain to go away, that the, the pain or the feelings are actually telling us that we are in situations where our boundaries are being trampled, whether we have the language for that or not. Yes. And sounds like what you do is help people understand boundaries, get language for what their needs and their boundaries actually are, and then learn to enact them in their relationships. Mm -hmm. Yes, you said that so well, Liz. Well, I, I love thinking about these things. And what occurs to me is that it's easier said than done, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think, you know, the hardest part about setting boundaries is really our assumption that people won't like them. And so we have a really hard time doing it because we're worried about what will this other person say? What will they think? What will they do? How will the interactions be in the future? And that's a really tough place to lit, be in your relationships from. And so for us to really feel comfortable setting boundaries, we have to be okay with perhaps someone pushing back, perhaps someone um, getting upset about it. And that's, that's really uncomfortable. But I will say most often what happens when we have boundaries is that someone um, actually accepts them and they say, okay, we just have to practice it. And the more we practice it, the better we get. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You quote another of my heroes, Brene Brown as saying that we need to get mm -hmm. comfortable choosing our own discomfort over resentment, mm -hmm. which I think is yeah. such a powerful thing that we are, we are going to be uncomfortable in the conversation about a boundary, even possibly our guilt and our fear afterwards, 
But mm-hmm. if we don't, the cost is resentment and burnout in the long haul. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we pay a, a huge price for not advocating for ourselves. And sometimes that price is our mental health. Sometimes that price is um, our emotional well being. Sometimes it's a financial price because we are unwilling to experience the discomfort of saying no or setting a boundary. And it really does cost us. You know, so often I'm asked, what boundaries do I need? And I think that's a question that we all have to answer for ourselves because my boundaries are not your boundaries and your boundaries are not my boundaries. It's really based on what I'm able to give and do for other people. And that's different for all of us. And so it's so important that we cater our boundaries to our lives, not to um, well, this person has this boundary or this is a boundary that I heard is good. What boundaries do you need and what boundaries work for you? Yeah, it's a pity there isn't a manual that we could all go by. You wrote so Well, oh, yeah. No, 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 I was just going to say, well, I think in the book, there are tons of examples of potential boundaries that you could have with family, friends romantic partners, in-laws. Um, but there are also um, lots of things that you'll have to come up with on your own. And I give you a beautiful blueprint of what those things could be, but because every situation is so unique, you will find yourself having to like come up with certain boundaries on the spot, right? Like, wow, I've never experienced this before. What could the boundary be? So it's a constant evolution of boundaries. It's like with the pandemic. I started writing this book before the pandemic. And as we were editing it, we were like trying to throw in these things like, ah, here's a here's something for the pandemic. Um, but you know, the pandemic brought on new types of boundaries needed. One of the really early ones was, you know, just because I'm home doesn't mean that I'm available because there were people, I don't know about you, but for me who who started to call more and, you know, wanted to be in contact more. And it's like, I am working, but it is at home. I'm not like watching TV all day. I'm actually working. And so having to set those boundaries, even in the pandemic, which were newer boundaries, I didn't, you know, I hadn't practiced those. It was just something that I started to experience. And I said, hey, this is, you know, this is a new issue. We've never experienced a pandemic, but certainly we need new boundaries. Absolutely. Wow. So you wrote so beautifully, you said, people don't know what you want. It's your job to make it clear and that clarity Mm -hmm. saves relationships. And you also wrote boundaries are not unspoken rules like they should have known better or common sense would say. And I wonder if you could speak a little bit about sort of the, the pull of implicit or unstated or assumed boundaries versus doing the hard work of actually articulating them. Mm, There is no such thing as an unassumed or assumed boundary. There is no such thing as an unspoken boundary. And that's what I was speaking to in the book, that, that boundaries are clearly stated. Because when we expect people to know something, what we're really lying on is this cultural belief of common sense. But as we all know, common sense, what's the quote? Common sense is not common. Right. Um, What we know is not what other people know, even the people we were raised with, because sometimes people will get hung up on, but it's my brother, they should know. And it's like, even your brother has different experiences from you. They have a different personality. They have a different way of understanding things. So even if it is someone you've known forever and they should know better, you may still have to tell them. Um, I have a doormat that says, kick off your shoes. You know, like the escapes on kick off your shoes, relax your feet. So my doormat says, kick off your shoes. There's two baskets at the door. Right. So, I, you know, if if I really wanted this, like, why didn't they get that? I still say to people when they come in, hey, do you mind taking your shoes off? Sometimes people get and they say, I saw the doormat, you know, and then other times people will say, oh, oh, OK, OK. You know, because it's not something that I should assume that other people know. How would they? 
If you don't even know that song, you don't even know the reference. So you're just looking at a mat and you're like, okay, you know, so it is up to me to really execute a boundary if it is important to me. Hmm. What's striking me now is how generous it actually is, an act of generosity to speak and, and refresh and reiterate your boundary rather mm -hmm. than assuming that someone should have it and just mm -hmm. should behave the way you need them to. You also brilliantly say there's two steps to a boundary. One is speaking it, and the second is backing it up with action. And I'm wondering if you'd share more about that part. Mm -hmm. So for years, boundaries have been spoken about in the way of say no, just say no, just say no. Then it evolved a little bit to tell people what you need and say no, tell people what you need and say no. I am saying that it's it's say no if you need to, say yes if you need to, tell people what you need, tell them what you like, tell them what you don't like. Um, also just make a statement about who you are. You know, those are all ways to verbalize a boundary. Also, boundary is a behavior. It's for you and for other people. Really with the behavior portion of it, the only person we can control is ourselves. So if we say to someone, hey, I'm working from nine to five, I'm not available to answer my phone, please don't call during that time. And then they call, here's where the behavior comes in. You have to let the call go to voicemail. That is the behavioral piece. And for many of us, we just hope that they listen to the boundary and they just don't call. But as we know, people have their own boundaries. <laughs> they, mm -hmm. they may call anyway, even when we ask them not to. And so we have to modify our behavior sometimes. And sometimes we're requesting that someone else modifies their behavior. So important and so tricky. So can I bring in a devil's advocate question here? Sure. I shared some of this with friends and colleagues and asked for the, the most um, pressing or challenging questions about boundaries. And so part of what comes up is confusion about where boundaries meet control or violation, right? So if somebody mm -hmm. says, I have a boundary that you have to do this or that you, you know, have to say this or can't say this, et cetera, how do you hold or discern what's boundary and what's infringement? Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. Um, there is a such thing as a healthy boundary. All boundaries are not healthy. Sometimes we are setting um, really rigid boundaries with people where we are building a wall, we're trying to control them, we're telling them what to do, um, we're making unhealthy requests sometimes. That's not healthy. But for healthy boundaries that are healthy for you and potentially healthy for the relationship, that is not controlling of another person. Um, when we think about our, you know, our homes, if we're asking someone, hey, you know, we have someone here with a peanut allergy, please don't bring any peanuts. Um, I guess depending on who you're talking to, it's like, you're trying to control my behavior of bringing peanuts. It's like, no, I'm trying to prevent an allergy outbreak. <laughs> so, you know, I think it's one of those things like your home, your rules, um, you know, your, your event, your rules, your, your, your person, your rules. And so you really have to think about like, what is my intention here? Is my intention to control who can eat peanuts and who can't? Or is my intention here to control a uh, visit to the ER? Like, you know, like what, what's really being questioned here? Because sometimes, you know, people can see that as control. You know, you have some, some situations where people will do it just because you ask them not to. Everybody's not agreeable. And so some people say, well, I did it anyway. It's not going to hurt anything. And then that's when you can exercise your boundary. You can say, well, this is my home. And, you know, I asked you not to do this thing. And so this is the consequence for, you know, not honoring my boundary in a particular way. 
So, you know, there, are, there is a such thing as, as healthy boundaries and there is a such thing as controlling people. But in relationships, both people have the opportunity to have boundaries. It's not just, you know, Nedra with all the boundaries. It's also Liz placing boundaries. Like, you know, put your coat in the closet when you come over. And then I'll say, take your shoes off when you come over. And then look at us. We're just in this big old happy boundary relationship. And so, you know, we both have expectations of each other. And also, you know, it's very important that I don't make um, your boundaries my boundaries. And I'm not saying like, well, since you asked me to put my coat, you know, like I don't, I don't have to take on your boundary if that's not my thing. You could throw your coat right there on the chair. I don't care. That's not my thing. This other thing is. Got it. So it's not about symmetry or reciprocal boundaries necessarily. It's about authentic, mm -hmm. healthy boundaries to what we need to be in relationship. Mm -hmm. beautiful hmm. well you mentioned COVID and all the boundaries that that suddenly became pertinent and I can share personally I, I live in a community of of eight adults if you can imagine that and so suddenly mm -hmm. things that were previously totally my business like who I see where I go became everybody's business because my behavior impacted their safety and their behavior impacted mine. And it was a profound experiment in suddenly needing, needing to negotiate boundaries that we had never, never, never needed to navigate before. And I think we learned a lot about the, the levels of boundaries that you described. So I think you say porous boundaries or weak boundaries and healthy boundaries and rigid boundaries on the other side. And it sounds like you sort of help people discern where they are and which direction they might want to flex. Do I have that right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, porous boundaries are really loose boundaries that are unstated. They are the unspoken rules. And sometimes that comes from a space of us not recognizing what we need. Hmm. Rigid boundaries are walls that we build to keep people out. We create expectations that are unreasonable we may place those expectations on ourselves or on other people. For example, a rigid boundary could be, I never become friends with my coworkers. Um, and that excludes a lot of people. And you may re meet some really nice people, but you're not open to those relationships because you have this hard rule of never creating relationships. So healthy boundaries are the ones we spoke about, the ones that are clearly stated, we actively practice them. They are um, healthy for our relationships. They are not aggressive, but they are assertive. Yeah. So I'm imagining you've spoken with hundreds, thousands, maybe tens of thousands of people, both online and in person, about the journey from what I'm lightly calling boundary clueless to boundary competent or something like that. Mm. And I'm mm -hmm. wondering if you could speak to the arc of people's experience from sort of recognizing and awakening and then building the muscles of setting boundaries. What does that trajectory tend to look like? Well, I think in the very beginning, as we start with anything, we're just not very good at things that we're beginning. You know, think riding a bike, think learning how to swim, think anything, mm -hmm. right? is not very easy at first, but the more we practice it, we can't even remember not knowing it. Like I can't even remember learning how to ride a bike. That's how good I am at riding a bike, right? Um, and I sort of feel that way about boundaries, like that guilty piece. I don't feel that necessarily anymore because now I was like, no, I need to tell them this. <laughs> it's like, I, it feels like this is something so pressing that I have to say it. I don't, you know, it. I have practiced it for so long that it feels reasonable to, to make a request or shift a behavior and to do so very assertively with people. Not, um, I think doing it earlier is, is really beneficial to the relationship rather than waiting for someone to offend me 10 times and saying something. So, you know, as soon as, you know, something new comes up, just letting someone know like, oh my gosh, like this is something that I noticed as we were, you know, going through this process in the future, could we blank? 
you know, just letting people know right away has mm -hmm. been really helpful. Sometimes in relationships, we have to do a lot of boundary cleanup though. And that's going back to these older relationships, mainly with family and long-term friends where there have been very porous boundaries. And now we have to really lay on the boundaries. It's like, wow, I actually need 700 boundaries with you. Let me start with number one today. Um, you know, and so you, you have to, you know, start to bring them up to speed on this new world of boundaries that you've discovered. Mm. And I always suggest doing that really slowly and not just jumping in and, you know, going 700 boundaries at one time, but maybe one and then allowing some time for, for people to adjust and get acquainted. And then two, allowing some time to adjust and for folks to get acquainted and, and really building from there. And, and you, you'll be surprised in how people will advocate for your boundaries um, just because they know how important those are to you. So the consistency piece is very, very important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You mentioned that, that as people embark on this journey, often what comes up is tremendous fear, fear that if they mm -hmm. set a boundary, they will lose the relationship, they'll be abandoned, something horrible will happen. Can you share more about what's common in that process? Mm. Well, that is the, the anxiety that, mm. that comes up when we're setting boundaries, the anxiety around the worst case scenario. Um, they'll stop talking to me. They'll be upset at me. They'll be mad at me. Future interactions will be so awkward. That is what anxiety tells us. None of that is typically rooted in fact. It's just the stories that we tell ourselves and those stories really talk us out of being able to set boundaries with people. Now, if this is a difficult person and you've had these experiences, then there are some very particular ways that you will need to set boundaries. But if this is a new experience and you just assume that it will go a certain way, it's very important to talk yourself off the ledge, affirm yourself, and state the boundary and allow it to really happen without having all of those bad stories on rotation. Yeah. So there are those horrible cat catastrophic stories about what might happen. And then mm -hmm. for many of us, there are the internalized equally awful stories about what it means if I set a boundary, right? Mm -hmm. I am bad. I am not nice. I should be more generous. I should be accommodating. There's sort of a whole inner world to navigate even once a boundary has been set. Yes, yes. And, and a lot of it is, you know, shifting your mindset away from boundaries are me because they're not. It's, it's not a mean thing. And when I think about you know, all of the boundaries that people have had with me and how those boundaries didn't destroy our relationships. It really gives me some courage to go forward with setting boundaries. I mean, tons of people have boundaries with me, my friends, people at work, um, you know, all sorts of folks. And mostly we just listen to the boundary and we say, okay, and we adhere to the boundary. We don't really push back when, you know, there's a traffic light and the light is saying, you need to stop here for traffic reasons. We don't get out our car and yell, we hate traffic lights. It's like, no, like this is a thing that we do. This is safe. Mm -hmm. It is a boundary. It is, you know, controlling the flow of traffic. And so there are tons of boundaries that we're already respecting. And so we have to believe that there are people who can also respect our boundaries in that very same way without the pushback. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it occurs to me that there may be times when pushback is essential, right? If, it's, if there's a defined relationship, maybe two people are partners or they work together and one person says, I have a boundary that I will not do this. And the other person says, good gracious, I have a boundary that you need to do this. My partner needs to do this or my employee needs to do this. Mm -hmm. And then we have a challenge and a, and a negotiation and possibly even a separation. Mm. Yeah, um, but that's that, that's that control you're talking about. I think mm. sometimes, hmm. The difference to me, like they need to do that. I think even using that language, it doesn't mean mm. that it's a boundary. 
Mm -hmm. You are still trying to um, inappropriately control someone's behavior. And it's not for um, the health or you of you or the health of the relationship. You know, in relationships, typically a certain level of acceptance of differences is a boundary, right? Like we're not going to be the same. We don't want to go to bed at the same time and that's okay. Um, and really figuring out what those things are for you. In the book, I have an area where I talk about like questions you should ask in the phase of dating. Like there are so many important questions that we miss out on. And then we have like these unspoken expectations. We have these assumed roles and we're like, I don't know how I got into cooking every day. And it's like, yeah, you never talked about who would cook the meals and you started doing it. It seems like you hate it. Um, this is a important conversation to have because through our behaviors, we can make certain agreements without verbalizing what those agreements are. So it's very important that we verbally communicate. Right. To really drag those unconscious entitlements out from the mm. shadows and get them on the table and say, is this something I stand by? Is this, is this who I want to be and what I need mm -hmm. or not? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You also write so beautifully about setting boundaries with ourselves. And that feels like mm -hmm. a whole wild, wonderful area to explore. Yeah. Yeah. The, the story I told in that chapter um, to start the chapter off was about financial boundaries mm -hmm. and so often um, we live in a society where when people make more money, they spend more money. They make more money, they spend more money. They make more money, they spend more money. Mm -hmm. And eventually the spending has grown bigger than the making. And what happens is we're like, you need more money. And it's like, no, you need boundaries. You need boundaries because you know, there is a such thing as poverty and there is a such thing as, as low income. Um, some people are not that and we are, you know, living beyond um, what we need to. And there's been, you know, a lot of talk around sustainability and being more essential and minimalistic in how we operate because this is, you know, for the people who have the ability to have more, there are some of us who are just consuming, 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 even when we can't afford it, even when we can't afford it. And so some self boundaries in those cases might be a budget. A self boundary could be saying no to yourself when you're trying to go above the budget. A self boundary could be not buying more things because you made five more dollars you know, making sure that you are honoring yourself in a way that fits into um, your income. And that situation was particularly for people who um, have the means to afford things and they find themselves in, in debt and all of these mm -hmm. things. And they're like, it's the money's fault. And it's like, no, it's just not the money's fault. It's, you know, it's your new car fault. Um, and so we have to be very care careful and set limits with ourselves. And that's not a bad thing. We can't have everything. I can't eat all the candy I want. I can't stay up as long as I want. You know, this isn't home alone. Um, and even little Kevin got tired of doing everything in excess. This thing like day three, he started missing his family because he's like, I stayed up. I watched all the movies. I used shaving cream, you know, all of the fun stuff. Now I need some boundaries. Where are my parents? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, bring me back to bring me back to reality. And he started to set them for himself. He started to have sensible dinners. He started to, you know, because it's like, how long can we operate in this space of like, I can do anything. I don't have to listen to anything. It's not healthy for us. We have to have a bedtime. We have to be willing to say no to ourselves and other people. We have to take time for ourselves to take care of ourselves. Those things are very important. And those are the boundaries that you have with yourself. And within those self boundaries, as we are operating in our relationships and we are moving in this space of they are doing this to me, we have to think about what can we do to manage these interactions 
on our end. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that is this disconnecting, detaching with love, um, you know, reshaping the relationship, maybe even stating your boundaries. There are so many things that you can do to improve the way that you feel about your relationship. Sometimes it's accepting people as they are and not changing them. That's a, you know, that's one of my favorite boundaries in relationships with people is just allowing them to be mm. <laughs> uh, because we can't change people. And when I understand like, wow, this person is, I mean, we've been doing this 32 years. <laughs> like they, you know, they, they really aren't going to get this. The freedom in saying like, this is something they can't get. Now, what do I do? Mm. Now I have some choices to make. Do I, do I want to continue in the way that I existed in the relationship? Do I want to step back? So those are the boundaries that you can set with yourself. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. And there are times when saying no to someone else offers the opportunity to say yes to oneself or to, mm. to manage your boundaries um, both internally and externally in a, in a sympathetic way. Mm -hmm. yeah okay new topic sure okay I wanted to ask about culture and boundaries and mm -hmm. from your experience what appears to be culturally universal and mm -hmm. what appears to be culture specific both in how we are raised around boundaries and about um, appropriate expression of boundaries mm. So I think all cultures have boundaries, right? And those boundaries look differently. In, in American culture, what I have found is we have these different cultural groups and we have, you know, there are some families where you feel comfortable like telling your, your parents, mm -hmm. I don't want to wear this or I'm, I want to do this or I don't want to do that. And there are other cultures where it is not comfortable to be disagreeable. And there's a lot of um, consequences for even doing that, right? Uh, one of the questions I'm asked most often is, how can I have boundaries as a Black person, right? Mm -hmm. and I'm a Black person, they're asking me, but they're asking as if I'm not. <laughs> um, and, and I say that, you know, I think that culturally, um, respect is a really big thing as it is with, you know, lots of cultures is a very big thing. And we can respectfully set boundaries with our parents and still honor our culture. You can set boundaries in a very respectful way. And I think that sometimes that's really scary when you have been taught that um, kids are to be seen and not heard. Mm -hmm. Kids don't have any feelings. You know, I'll tell you how to feel in these sorts of things that can be cultural messages that you receive. Um, those messages sometimes are just not good for your mental health because it is important for you to be heard. It is important for you to be seen. It is important for you to have a voice. And in most cases, um, parents want you to have that. They just don't want you to have it with them at that moment. <laughs> so <laughs> once they release you into the world, they want you to be assertive. They want you to stand up for themselves or yourself. They don't want you to do it in the grocery store. They don't want you to do it when you're in ninth grade. They want you to do it, you know, when you, you, you are in your own space and all of those sorts of things. But for parents, it's, it's really important that that we learn to honor kids' boundaries because it'll really help them grow up to be boundary people. And we are really, you know, people without boundaries because we had them some long away along the way, but we have been talked out of them. We have been moved away from them. We have our preferences, but we're afraid to show them because of the pushback. And so I would say you know, in terms of culture, it's very important to honor your culture and it is very important to honor your boundaries. That's so well said. 
I, I work with a lot of students who are becoming therapists in the community mental health program. And these are individuals who are very, very devoted to anti-oppressive practices in psychotherapy mm. and honoring diversity. And a question that comes up often is, you know, these labels like enmeshed or codependent come from a particular cultural paradigm and, mm -hmm. and, and really deserve careful thought before sort of applying them out mm -hmm. of the box to mm -hmm. families from cultural backgrounds that we don't come from and we don't know. Mm -hmm. And I, I wonder how you hold that with all of your work around boundaries. Mm. Well, yeah, enmeshment is okay as long as no one un is uncomfortable with enmeshment. Got it. You know, and mm. so it's one of those things that it's only an issue if someone has an issue with it. If everyone in the culture is doing the same thing, it, it, there's no term for it. It's, this is how we live. You know, I've heard people say, well, I come from a loud family and that's fine as long as everybody remains loud. But the moment that someone is like, oh my gosh, you, we're, we're too loud. It's like, now, ah. mm -hmm. <laughs> now we are identified as the loud family and there is something to be done about it. So you're right. There are certain terms like enmeshment and um, you know narcissism and you know just all of these terms that we sort of throw around that in some cultures it's normal for a person to feel like they're powerful. It's normal for a, a family to do most things together, um, and it doesn't mean that it's again we can't have boundary problems that we don't really have. Like if somebody is in a close-knit relationship and it's okay with them, I don't have a boundary problem. Yeah. <laughs> like, I can't set boundaries for them. The only time that becomes an issue is if they find it challenging. And that's the only time we need to address it. We don't need to address things that are not a problem to other people, unless it's just you know unhealthy or harmful in some sort of illegal um, sexual, like, like some way that's like, this is a crime type thing. But mm -hmm. if it's just like, all right, so you, this is what you do in your culture, then we do have to accept that. I think that's one of those things we can't put labels on something that people don't have an issue with. Got it. So it's not up to the therapist to assess, diagnose, label, problematize something that's working, but perhaps to help give language and distinction when something isn't working to what Correct. might be some of the cause of the suffering. Correct. It's such tricky terrain. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, you started to talk about kids and families and I, you, you wrote beautifully, parents who don't model healthy boundaries inadvertently teach kids unhealthy boundaries. And I, am, I wonder what you would offer to parents or parents-to-be about how to both keep kids safe, right? It's not like do whatever you want whenever you want, and to teach and model and support emerging boundaries. Mm. Well, as parents, it's, it's very important that we allow kids to have a voice and we help them to use their voice. Sometimes with kids, as we know, the way that they say things is, it can be inappropriate. It can be hurtful to other people. And so in the parenting role, helping them to understand the difference between assertiveness and aggressiveness is very important. And so as they are coming across with, it, with their boundaries, you know, it's appropriate for you to say, I'm full, I don't want to eat anymore. It's not okay for you to throw your plate on the floor. Mm. You know, and so mm -hmm. really showing them how they can set the boundary, appropriate ways to set the boundary, because we get really upset when they are being aggressive. And a lot of that is they don't know. <laughs> they just don't know. They think, you know, I remember um, I have two kids and I remember maybe around the nine month mark, when they're tired of eating something, they literally just throw it on the floor. Like in their brain, it's like, no, don't want peas. <laughs> it's like done. <laughs> um, 
And it's like, they don't know. And so you have to teach them like, oh, baby, just leave your peas here. You know, like you have mm-hmm. to talk to them. And once they have some understanding, they start to pile their peas over to the side, you know? But to assume that the baby knows, you know, not to mm-hmm. not to put the peas here. They haven't been here before. And that is our job to kind of step in and help them understand um, it's okay for you to not like peas, but also don't throw them on the floor, set them here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's a, there's a philosopher named Alain de Botton, and he writes about how, how generous we are in our interpretations of children's intentions when they do things are inappropriate, inappropriate. As you said, you say, oh, honey, we don't do it this way. We do it this way. And that often with adults, when they don't meet our expectations or they step on our boundaries, we are incensed, enraged, offended that they have violated what what we assume to be universal. And so I read your book in many ways as a call to be willing to say it multiple times as though it were the first time. Nope, this is not how we do with me. Mm -hmm. We do it a different way with the same Mm -hmm. sort of spirit of generosity and firmness that we would with somebody who's young. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that often we forget Hmm. the patience that we can have with children when we are interacting with adults Hmm. because our perception is like they should know better Mm -hmm. about everything we don't know what kind of childhood that they've had in some cases Hmm. we don't know you know their level of functioning mentally like we don't know much we're like why that that person should know better and it's like Maybe they don't, maybe, maybe they shouldn't know better. Like how will they know better? Like there are so many questions. And so Mm -hmm. to really keep your stress down, it's important just to tell people and to be really clearly honest with them about the things that you want, not assuming that they know and being as gentle with them as you would be with a child and how you teach them. Mm-hmm. And how you kind of check back and make sure that they understand, because truly, many of us, we have that little part of ourselves that still can understand the little voice of nurture from an adult. And so it's really important to continue to have that same compassion as, you know, as you would a one or two year old, like perhaps they don't know this could be their first time, or at least it's their first time with you. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah. Of course, thinking about teenagers comes to mind and teenagers are sort of known for challenging boundaries, perhaps in a perfectly developmentally appropriate way. I'm curious about guidance you might have for parents and or in a perfect world, how might we embed education in our school systems, in other social structures that help teenagers to really gain some wisdom and practice around boundaries? Mm. Teenagers are such a special bunch. Um, you know, one of the most important things I think about when, when working with teenagers is really honoring their desire to become more of themselves. Mm. Because teenagers are really learning about who they are. They're learning how to, to think about the world because they have a little more understanding of, oh, when this person say that, it means this. And really having those conversations and allowing them to be self thinkers as as far as as far as that can go and be safe, right? Like we want to again make sure they're not going too far with it, but certainly allowing them to come up to their own conclu- come up with their own conclusions sometimes and really express who they are is really important. And that doesn't mean you have to let your, you know, your kids daddy hair or, you know, do whatever they want to because you have boundaries. However, it might mean having those conversations about why they want to do it and, and those sorts of things and still expressing your boundary. But with teenagers, it's very important to remember that teenagers and kids are people. They have mm. feelings. They're, they're, um, their issues are really big problems. I think sometimes adults forget that. We get so in adult mode and, you know, paying bills and having real problems that when a kid or a teenager comes to us with a problem, it's like, 
why do you care about what they say to you? And it's like, oh my gosh, to be 15, you do care. Mm. Oh my, it, it's everything. It's everything. They should care about that. I mean, yeah, you don't care about, you know, the big problems I have, but what you have is a really big problem. So listening to teenagers is a wonderful way to find out what their boundaries are and really to help them think about boundaries in a new way. Like, you know, with their bodies, what people say to them, how to address their peers. Those are all really important things and conversations that we can have with teenagers. Yeah, I know someone who quoted someone as saying, all you have to do with teenagers is get really curious about who they are becoming. Mm. That you really express that spirit beautifully. Mm. I, I'm curious, you know, we've been speaking about how parents and caregivers can be with children. And I'm curious about the education system or, or broader social structures. Perhaps the question is, if somebody said, Nedra, your book rocked my world and I'm gonna write you a billion dollar check to fix, the issues of boundaries in our society, what are some of the things you might do or implement? You know, one thing, and I've seen this happening some, 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 is kids need to be taught to understand and react to their feelings. And when I say react, I don't mean like, you know, punch a teddy bear, but to self-soothe in healthy mm -hmm. ways, to um, ground themselves. Those are very important things that kids need to be taught. I think that would be a cure for so many things because we are just uncomfortable feeling anything. But if we could teach them how to feel and help them think of ways to ground themselves and talk about what might make them feel better, they will already have the boundaries. And then it will be our job to really listen to them. Because in lots of cases, kids already have the boundaries and it's the adults around them telling them, push your boundary down, push your boundary down. Kids know, oh my gosh, I hate wearing this. It makes my stomach, mm. whatever. Oh, I hate going over so-and-so's house. Uh, they, they know a lot of these things, but they are pushed into these situations because it's more comfortable for the adults. So if we could do some parent education with this billion dollar grant that you're giving me, that would be really helpful for kids because I think they already got it. I think if you just you just nurture was naturally there and help them, you know, talk more about their feelings, and then we help the parents understand it's okay for them to feel. You, they are not threatening you by saying, "I don't, I don't want you to kiss me on the mouth" or something. Mm -hmm. You know, like the, these are this is their personal space, and for whatever reason, it doesn't feel comfortable to them. How can we go about honoring it? Wow. Part of what I hear you saying is that, first of all, kids do have all the preferences, all the, the desires and the, the, actually the will and the boundaries built in, but mm -hmm. we, they get socialized out of expressing them freely. And mm -hmm. I, I find myself wondering about gender and how, mm -hmm. um, how gender gets socialized into people and, and boundaries get socialized out of people. I wonder if that's something you want to reflect on. Mm -hmm. Well, certainly, I think from a young age, um, kids are given very particular roles. You know, if it's a if it's a girl, you get all the pink, you get a baby doll, you get this. Like they're telling you right away, nurture, wear these colors, do that. Mm -hmm. And the moment that there is some, you know, some girls like my favorite color is black. It's like your favorite color can't be black. You know, there is this like reshaping of who they are if they want to play with trucks or you know like it's like no this is the only way to be this thing this is the only way to be this other thing and in society that's why we have so many conversations about well it's not masculine to do this or he's too feminine or this is too that because we have these very strong ideas around um, if you do this, then it means that. And sometimes it's just like, you know, humans are nurturing humans. Mm. It's not a, you know, it's not a gender thing. Um, 
it is a human thing that, you know, any human who sees another human suffering, um, most of us would kind of jump in and help. And so it's just really important that we neutralize some of these things that we're just giving these like, this is that role, this is that role, um, that we neutralize some of those things. And you're right, like in terms of boundaries, um, yeah, we, we're talking kids out of their boundaries because it's just not comfortable for the adult. And sometimes, you know, it, it, it makes sense to because kids can't be eat. you know, some parents have kids who will eat macaroni every single day for dinner if they could. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, yeah, you can't. Like there are some days you just have to have a little broccoli and asparagus to go with your macaroni. Um, and, and maybe you could just take two bites and eat the rest of, you know, your macaroni. However, um, there needs to be some variety here for you to grow up and be strong and healthy. And so there are some things that you can do as a parent to kind of implement some other things, but still honoring, you know, who they are as a person when reasonable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, if, and so if we're not socializing or training kids out of their, their innate boundaries, I wonder if we raise kids who are less vulnerable to trauma or to having their boundaries trampled or ignoring impending warning signs of major boundary infringement that is really quite prevalent in our society today. And mm -hmm. I wonder if you want to speak at all about trauma and what you see. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Oprah had a recent episode on her podcast where she talked about people who were, um, their intuition was telling them that this situation was unsafe, but they thought, no, this person is being really nice. You know, people aren't that mean. They bypass their intuition, their gut feeling, and they got themselves into some pretty dangerous situations. I am saying that to say our feelings are telling us something and we can't ignore them. So when children say, I don't like so-and-so, this makes me uncomfortable. Allow them to really have those preferences mm -hmm. and figure out something else, whether it's a sitter, an aunt, an uncle, or whatever. Figure out something else if you can. And I know in some instances we just can't, right? But there are real times where people are having problems. Now, there are some times where kids are just, just not liking people because they can't play all day at so-and-so house, right? But there are other times where there is nothing that you could see going on, but maybe there is something going on with this kid where they are uncomfortable in a situation and we really have to allow them to, to have that discomfort and we have to show them that I honor that. I honor that you know when something is uncomfortable for you. You know, particularly with physical space, people are, you know, they are very shocking, even with like babies. People will like touch strangers' kids and, you know, they'll touch kids' faces. And it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. energy exchange, energy exchange, mm -hmm. like, don't touch my kid. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. you know, it, 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 there are so many things where it's like, because I'm an adult, I am entitled to your space. Even if you're a stranger, because I'm an adult, I'm entitled to pinch your cheek. Pinching hurts. <laughs> you, know, like, you know, like there are these, these things that we do that we are so like not even thinking about and how we're teaching people to bypass what feels uncomfortable to them to be nice to other people. Isn't, I mean, you you had, oh, she pinched my cheek. Uh, you know, it's like, that really hurt me. Mm. And so we have to allow them to have like a voice, some autonomy, some space. And when they say it, if we can do something about it, we should, we should try. Mm. So well said. So Nedra, I've asked you about 101 questions and I wonder what we have not talked about that you might wanna address, whether it's current events or you know, the whole range of your wisdom. Where should we go? Mm. Um, well, I see we have some, some Q and A questions. Would you like to go there? 
Absolutely. We can dive right into questions unless there's anything else that you want to share. Mm. You know, I think one of the biggest things I want to share is that boundaries get better with practice. Mm. And at any time, you can shift your boundaries. I think for so many of us, we're like, well, I've been this way for X amount of time until today. Until today, you can be something different. You can want something different. You can do something different. You don't have to continue to function in a way just because you've done it. And that happens sometimes when we are in relationships that are long-term and we've had porous boundaries and we continue to show up a certain way that doesn't make us feel really good. Um, one of the things I've been talking about as you know, people are becoming more vaccinated and restrictions are, mm. you know, being opened up in some spaces that whatever, whatever boundaries you enjoyed in the pandemic, you can continue to enjoy those boundaries, even though the governor has said whatever, right? So if you enjoy not going to to Christmas dinner, or you've enjoyed not going to 72 happy hours and birthday parties, you can continue whatever you want to. Like you don't have to, you know, now go back, oh, everything's back to normal. I, I can't have boundaries again. It's like, no, you can. You can, you found the boundary that you like, stick with it. Seems like you've been doing pretty good for a whole year. Keep it going, keep the habit of the boundary and, and create the life that you want. And sometimes, you know, that's not going to be appealing to other people, but it makes you feel comfortable. I, you know, I'm passionate about this work because as a therapist, you do see people who suffer, suffer with mental health issues. I mean, medica on medication because they don't want to set boundaries. Mm -hmm. especially around the holidays it's like oh I gotta go get me some you know whatever because I have to be able to survive this encounter with people I don't want to be around and so it's really important to talk about the need the need for boundaries in our relationships and how not having them physically, mentally, and spiritually makes us unwell. Well, amen. There's such a, there's a profound and fundamental communication here, which is that you, you can do what you want to do. Mm -hmm. And that while obligation and should, and I have to is going to come up and perhaps merits investigation, right? We don't just mm -hmm. eat ice cream all day because that's what we feel like it. Mm -hmm. we, we are fundamentally liberated to to do what helps us thrive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure yeah. everybody grows up with that as the core yeah. message about welcome to life. Yeah, I don't, you know, I'm not sure if I grew up with that core messaging from other people, but I certainly felt it. Mm. I certainly felt it. And I was, you know, pretty assertive, probably aggressive um, kid and saying, you know, like, this is my preference. Um, and in, in, in some respects, it was honored and I completely appreciate, you know, my mother for doing that in, in some regards. And I think that it's so important to, to allow kids to just, you know, have a voice because they do have a choice. And, you know, back to the pandemic thing, I think it's going to be very interesting for folks who are in spaces with people who have different boundaries with them around the pandemic as we're moving forward, because there are some people who will have boundaries that we don't like because we do want to, you know, hang out and, on the holidays or we do want them to come to our birthday party. And so it'll be a really interesting experiment in respecting you know, other people's boundaries and, and how the pandemic has reshaped um, the narrative for some people and how they'll engage in the future. Well, what a wonderful segue to our first question, if we can head that direction. Mm -hmm. Someone from the audience says, 
what advice do you have for people navigating changing boundaries on both sides of the equation? Mm. Well, I would say, you know, again, clearly state what those boundaries are. And it's important to understand that your boundaries don't have to be the same as someone else's. And that everybody's boundary, as long as it's healthy, can be seen as important. And you can do both. You don't have to like pick a boundary. If you say, um, here's my thing and here's your thing, you can do both of those things. We're not one dimensional. We typically operate in the space of being able to do multiple things. So as it comes to boundaries, if you have a boundary and I have a boundary, that is okay for us to both have boundaries. Now I will say retaliatory boundaries um, is not always a good thing because sometimes we will start to have boundaries mm -hmm. because somebody have boundaries with us. It's like, well, if that's your boundary, here is my boundary. It's like we out boundary people. It's like, whoa, this is not the boundary <laughs> challenge. This is just, you know, either you have them or you do not, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's very important to, to know that there is space for multiple boundaries because we all have boundaries. We may not have them at the exact same time, but we all have boundaries in our relationships with people. So having them at the same time is fine. You can do it. Thank you. you know, I want to follow up on that about being on the other side of the equation, being the receiver of a new boundary that's maybe unexpected, uncomfortable, unwanted. What mm -hmm. advice do you have for metabolizing that with grace? Mm -hmm. Well, when things come to us new, it can be a bit uncomfortable, particularly um, if the person has been sitting on the boundary for a while without expressing it. Mm. And our work is to really honor it without personalizing it. And that's really hard because sometimes the boundary is just for them to feel safe and comfortable and it has very little to do with us. And so just allowing a person to have a perspective that is different from yours can be a very loving thing in a relationship. And a person setting a boundary with you is a sign that they want to be in the relationship. Mm -hmm. They want to make the relationship better. They want the relationship to be healthy. So even the attempt at setting a boundary with you is a good thing, even if you don't like the boundary, because when people are ready to leave relationships, the boundary they set is right. cutting the relationship off. So if they are coming to you and saying, this is what I would like, this or this is what I need, accept it as, oh, wow, they're trying to stay in this relationship and make it a healthier space. Man, I wish every boundary came with that caveat that we could remember. This is a compliment, mm -hmm. this is a gift, this is an investment in our relationship, mm -hmm. even though it feels terrible right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, another question from the audience. How do I start setting boundaries with people I haven't done so with before? Mm. Well, if you haven't set a boundary with them before, think about the roughest part of the relationship um, sometimes we have this one really big thing with people and then other times we have 25 big things with people, but think of the, the thing that like stirs your pot the most, like what is that thing? And you can do it a few ways. You can wait for it to happen again and state the boundary. Then you can just call them and say, Hey, I want to talk to you about something and tell them what the boundary is. Um, either of those ways could work. I tend to err on the side of whatever I figure out what my boundary is, I have to say it right away. Like I can't even wait. I'm like, oh, new boundary, let me call them. Because it just, I don't like the torture of having to have a conversation about something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, mm -hmm. I have to wait two weeks. You know, it's like, I wanna get it out of the way. And so, depending on your personality, you do what works best for you. But when you are new to setting a boundary, you haven't done it before, try not to work yourself up to 
this anxious space of, and then they'll say this, and then I'll say that, and then they'll say this, and then I'm gonna walk out the room. And you know, like all of those sort of things, because none of that is typically true. What typically happens is some other version of events. And so don't overthink the situation. Think of one or two sentences that you could say to really execute your boundary. I would like, I want, I need, I expect, mm -hmm. and not really thinking about, I need to tell them my feelings. I need to tell them why. I need to tell them the backstory and how they last offended me. Because when you are very new at setting boundaries, you don't want to be talked out of the boundary because they don't agree with you. They push back. So the less information you give early on, the better it might feel for you because you're just practicing like one line. Mm, so tempting to justify and explain and defend when really mm -hmm. a simple communication needs to eventually just stand on its own. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. Well, our next question points to this. Someone writes, how do you set boundaries with difficult people who always push back or take your boundary as a personal attack on themselves? Mm. Well, difficult people are people. And so they are entitled to a response. You don't have to like their response to set a boundary with them. I, um, I started working out with a trainer and I told him on the first day that I did this, I said, I'm a whiner. What did I mean? When you tell me to do something, I'm gonna, oh my gosh, I gotta do one more over here. Oh, doesn't mean that I won't do it. It just means that I will whine in the process. If you say, hey, do you wanna go to a football game? It's outside. It's going to be cold. Y'all go, oh my gosh, it's so cold. It's so, doesn't mean I'm ready to leave. <laughs> it just means I'm whining. So I think sometimes with difficult people, we take their reaction as <gasps> they won't listen to the boundary. They can complain while listening to your boundary as long as they're listening to your boundary. And so a lot of that conversation they have is in our inner dialogue on the outside. <laughs> It doesn't mean that they won't honor your request. Now, maybe your next boundary is, please don't complain about the boundaries I set. Um, maybe that's the next boundary. Uh, but just in them having some sort of reaction to it, it doesn't mean that they won't adhere to your boundary. Now, there are some difficult people who will push back. They will ignore you. And for that, you have to restate your boundary. You have to hold your boundary. That is the that is the boundaries with yourself part. You have to really hold the boundary. With difficult people, it's so important that you restate what you need until they get it. Or you could decide how you want to show up in that relationship. If you want to be in a relationship with someone that you have to continue to set the boundary with over and over. And so it's really a personal preference thing. But I think in most cases, when people don't want to listen to something, they can pretend as if they didn't hear it. And a part of your work is to restate it until they actually get it. It's like teaching someone something. Mm -hmm. You don't teach them something one time and say, okay, that's how you cook chicken. All right, I'm out of here. It's like, no, like you have to continue to teach them on and on and on. And then it's like, you know, the 20th time it's like, okay, I think I have this chicken recipe down. So you have to allow them to adjust, to practice, and to understand what is happening. Got it. So it's not that they have to be perfect on the first time or that they have to be happy about your boundary. In fact, mm -hmm. you don't really get a say in how they feel about it, but you mm -hmm. might have a say in how much you want to process about a boundary or how much of their feelings you're willing to hear and hold in mm -hmm. reaction to your boundary. Yes. Wonderful. All right. Here's a question from Jessica who says, how do you suggest overcoming the anxiety that comes with setting boundaries? Practice setting them more often. The, the treatment for anxiety is typically exposure. It's typically exposure. Um, when you think about fears of flying, fears of snakes, mm -hmm. um, 
discomfort talking in front of audiences. The, fee, the, the, the treatment is talk in front of people more often, get on the airplane, put a snake on your foot, then let, you know, it's like you have to expose yourself to the uncomfortable event until it feels bearable, until it feels normal, until it feels okay, or whatever word you want to use. But avoiding it actually will increase the anxiety because you have the ability to build more like worrying thoughts around it. You have the ability to say, oh, they won't do this. They won't do that. This is what they'll say because you have not really done anything about it. So if you really want to um, confront the anxiety around setting boundaries, you will have to set the boundary. Like being at the gym with the trainer, building the muscle over and over again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, you wrote in your book about people whose lives are in chaos because they are avoiding uncomfortable conversations and instead just not showing up for things or sort of, you know, vanishing from potentially uncomfortable conversations. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. I imagine it takes a tremendous amount of courage to turn towards, just like for me, it would be terrifying to hold a snake to turn towards what, what, what you imagine is catastrophically damaging to a relationship. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. It, I don't think it's the easy thing. I, I would not say that it's easy to um, start having these really diff difficult conversations, but I think it's absolutely life-changing. Mm. And I think in doing it, you will be so doggone proud of yourself. I can think of, you know, times where I've set boundaries and I've called a friend after like, you will not believe what I just said. Like just so yeah. proud of myself that I was courageous enough to, to really say no or ask for what I needed in the situation is such a good feeling. It's such a good feeling after you do it, even if it's really scary to do it. Wow, how wonderful if we and our friendships could celebrate that, just the way we would celebrate a promotion or running a 5K. Mm -hmm. I set a hard boundary and I did it. Yes, yeah. yes. All right, well, here's a specific question. Somebody writes, when financial stability does not exist with or for family members, how can I not feel guilty for not sharing money when many people I care for are always struggling financially? Do I make them codependent? What is a healthy boundary, et cetera? Mm. So here's the choice in it. You don't have to share if you don't want to. I think that's really tough because we are taught that we have to share if we have mm. more. Sharing is a choice. And you can choose to do it if you want to, and you can choose not to do it. That means that there are going to be some people who may be upset because you choose not to do it. When sharing money, I always think about, um, are you in a position to share? Some of us are not. And we're sharing resources that we really don't have to offer to other people. I always say I loaned the most money when I had the least amount of it. And it was the silliest thing I ever did. I'm like, how was I giving mm. people money? <laughs> like it, because my mindset was I have to help I have to help it was but I was in a position where I needed help I needed help I needed help it's like this isn't the space where you help people out <laughs> uh -huh. like, you wait until you get a lot more to take care of yourself to actually help people and so we have to really determine who we can help and how if it's an ongoing issue with people, chances are we're not really benefiting them by giving them money. I wonder what other resource we could give them so that they can long-term be a bit more financially stable. And it's not always helpful to give someone $100 for your cell phone bill or $20 for this or 20 over and over and over. How can we help them be in a position to create that income in their lives. Perhaps it is giving them a job lead. Perhaps 
It is, you know, telling them, hey, have you thought about a part-time job or some other arrangement if you're not con comfortable continuing to help them financially? Got it. Okay, here's a question from Katie. What do you do when your boundaries conflict directly with another person's boundaries? What's your advice for navigating these negotiations? Mm. Well, the first thing is to determine if the boundaries are healthy. Sometimes we are having boundary collisions and both of the boundaries are unhealthy or one of the boundaries is unhealthy. And I think of it like, you know, when you start to cohabitate with a partner, you decide which of the items that you all brought into the relationships are the best. You pick the best iron. You don't say, I get to keep my iron and you get to keep your iron because we had them both for two years. It's like, no, which one has the steam function? Which one squirts out okay? You pick the thing that works best. Um, and that is the negotiation. You don't keep two sofas and two sets of silverware and all of these things. You say, actually, your knives are sharper. And so there does, you know, there, there does have to be some level of acknowledgement that maybe another person has a better idea than you. Maybe there has to be some, mm, maybe we can blend the boundary in this way. There, there will be conversations around what is the best way to reach an agreement on boundaries. But the first step is to figure out if the boundaries are healthy. Yeah, okay, maybe that's the million dollar question here is how do you discern whether your boundary or somebody else's boundary is healthy or not? Is there a guideline or a rubric for that? Mm. What is the benefit to the relationship? If this thing is done, how does it shape or shift the relationship? Mm. If it's, you know, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to be in a monogamous relationship and you do. And my boundary is this. Well, if you leave, if you're, you know, if you have issues with being faithful, I will leave the relationship. Sounds like you need to keep the boundary. <laughs> now, if you don't, if you don't care about the relationship, if you say my boundary is so big, I need to leave. Then, then you have to go with your thing. But what is healthy for the relationship that you want to be in? What makes the most sense for the two of you? Not what makes the most sense for couples in general, but for the two of you, what makes the most sense? How does this boundary benefit or harm the relationship? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, this is related. Somebody writes, can you provide some specific tips or strategies for establishing or reestablishing boundaries with a partner or spouse around housework and emotional labor? Mm. Yes. So be very clear about what you want. Um, I think sometimes, particularly when I am working with couples, it tends to be, not always, but it tends to be a woman saying that she's not getting enough domestic support. And you will be shocked at how often the male partner is shocked. He's never mm. heard this. Mm. He's never heard it. He's seen her mad. He's seen her frustrated. He's seen her expressing resentment, but he has never heard, honey, can you do the dishes? Hasn't heard it. The woman typically says, well, he should know we have to eat. Oh gosh, okay, it goes back to this. We can't assume that he knows. Clearly he doesn't care about dishes. <laughs> so mm -hmm. We have to very clearly state when I cook, can you do, please do the dishes afterwards. If the dishes aren't done, we will need to get carried. It has to clearly be stated what you want, what you need, you need to make a schedule. And sometimes for couples who have means, I often suggest get a housekeeper. Get a housekeeper if you can afford it in the pandemic um, have them wear a mask, but it is a beautiful way to take arguing out of your relationship, particularly if your partner is unwilling to help and you love your partner enough to stay in the relationship. 
there could be other things that you could do other than doing that. If you are in a situation where you cannot afford a housekeeper, I think it's very important to, or if you don't want one, to make a list of tasks and to allocate them based on ability. Mm -hmm. not, on, not on gender role, but on ability. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes, sometimes, you know, one person is a better trip planner than the other person. One partner is a better cook than the other person. So if we're relying on gender and, and this person is cooking food that is not so great <laughs> just because of their gender, that's not very helpful. Um, and so just making sure that we're having relationships based on what we're actually able to do and not what we should do, be, do because of our gender. In the New York Times, they had a really good article at the beginning of the pandemic about how same gender couples were doing such a great job at domestic duties and how heterosexual couples needed to mm -hmm. take some tips from them because that gender role piece is, is not as prevalent and they have to talk about like who's doing what, which makes so much sense to say, who's, who now, who doesn't mind taking a trash out? Who, who, who's a better, who, who cooks breakfast better? Who, you know, all of these things that we do in relationships, not just falling into a role, but really talking about who does what best, who, um, who could stand to learn a little bit of something and is willing to learn it. So the pressure is not all on one person. Yeah, I'm really hearing you sort of say, hey, it's not just about unconditional love or infinite generosity, that expectations are healthy and that we, we would benefit to, to think of our relationships as by design. So rather mm -hmm. than just sort of you know, coming out of a mold of how it should work, that we really ask the questions and, and design our agreements based on the two people at this time that might be again revised tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, most of us didn't get the education in how to do that. And we are, we are mm -hmm. building those skills the hard way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, I have one more question for you. There's a question from Natasha who writes, how do you know if you're enmeshed in a family system? Mm. Yeah, we talked about this word earlier. And, you know, I think with enmeshed families, typically uh, mental health professionals will say you're enmeshed if mm. um, there is no ability for you to be autonomous in a family system, that having a separate sense of being is unwelcome. And then in some ways there's a lot of pushback. So everybody goes to bed at nine. If somebody tries to go to bed at 10 o'clock, it becomes, oh my gosh, can you believe that they're not going to bed at the same time as us? Um, everybody sort of has to, to do the same thing. I think of enmeshment like this, like this is a, a healthy relationship. We can go away, we can do our thing, and we can come back together with enmeshment. We're like this. Mm. We can't break apart. If anybody tries to get out, it's like, no, you can't leave, you can't leave. And so it's really important for us to be close. We can be close and still have our time apart and come together. And that's such a, a healthy part of relationships. But as we said earlier, is enmeshment a problem if you don't realize that it's a problem? Mm -mm. Yeah. Yeah. If nobody's suffering, yeah. we're just doing Nobody's what we do. suffering. What problem do we have? None. We don't yeah. have any. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, Nedra, I'm so grateful that you have done the work to tease this apart and to articulate it so clearly. I know you've been of service to so many through your social media work and very shortly via your book. Do you want to tell anybody mm -hmm. about how they could get their hands on your book? Yes. Yeah, so my book is available right now everywhere that books are sold. Um, it has become a New York Times bestseller just in two weeks which I am just blown away by. Um, the book really is everything I needed to know about 
20 years ago about mm. boundaries and everything that we we need to know currently about boundaries because it's a continuous practice. And so I see it as something that you will read and reread as you need to. I, I certainly have some books that I reread every year because it's like, I need my refresher. And I hope that this will be a book for many of us because boundaries are constantly changing and shifting as we move in and out of relationships or into different situations. So this book is a detailed illustration from start to finish of the importance of boundaries and how they could look in your life. I will second that recommendation. I enjoyed it so much. Nadra, is there anything else you want to share with us before we close tonight? Um, yeah, so I have an active Instagram account. So if you don't follow me there, please do. I am at Nedra Tawab. It is where I'm most present um, on the internet and on social media. So please follow me there. I talk about relationships and mental health. Wonderful. Well, thank you so, so much for your time and your presence and your heart with us tonight. Um, thank you everyone who's been with us here on YouTube tonight. Before we close, I want to invite up Jason from CIIS who will just wrap us up. Thank you all so much for attending today. We hope that you will join us for more of our upcoming talks and workshops. This conversation was recorded. If you'd like to watch it again or share it with the community, it will be available on our YouTube channel at the same link and on our Facebook page. We will also feature this talk on our podcast, which you can find at www.ciispod.com or by searching CIIS Public Programs on your favorite podcast app. Thanks again for joining us and good night. Mm -hmm.